you can see that theta is measuring the angular distance between the two pits. Well, what do we want? Do we want a big theta or a small theta? Because that means we're crowding as, much in, in as many pits as close to each other as possible. So this is putting a minimum value on theta. The smallest theta you can use is the theta that puts the light at the first dark spot over here. Um, well, If you look it up in the book, you'll see this is the formula for destructive interference. We actually showed um, kind of how to understand, I think, yeah. where this comes from before. It, it kind of makes sense. In order to have destructive interference, you want to be half a wavelength out of sync. So this is where the half a wavelength out of sync is coming in. Um, now, remember, we want to focus on the first dark spot. Well, the first dark spot is when m is 0. So that would give us this formula over here. Or if we have a small angle, remember we could use the small angle approximation. Remember the small angle approximation, the sine of theta is approximately the same as the tangent of theta. Well, the tangent of theta here is opposite over uh, adjacent y over l. So we could also use this as the small angle approximation, because we certainly have very small angles inside of a DVD player. All right, and this then would give us um, so now this will tell us. Uh, again, the smallest theta that we can have. It tells us the smallest that the angle can be between these two pits over here. So if you want to know how much information you can crunch in, you would plug in your lambda and you would plug in d. Remember, d is the width of the slit over here. Um, and then that would uh, tell you uh, how big theta is over here. Okay, so this puts uh, a lower limit on how close the pits can be. All right, now um, again, we gave an argument for why um, the light from this pit has to go into the dark spot. The argument I gave you is not 100% technically correct. There's a, the full arguments in the textbook, but this is good enough to understand this. This is good enough to understand why we're focusing on the first dark spot. Uh, there's a more technically correct answer in the textbook, but this will be good enough for us. Okay, so um, how do we use this to solve problems? All right, so what do we want? Would we like theta to be, to be big or small? small? So what type of light should our DVD player use? Um, low wavelength. Yeah, that's the most important point to get from this whole discussion here. We want a small wavelength. Because a small wavelength on the right-hand side would lead to a small theta on the left-hand side, and that would allow us to put the pits closer to each other. The smaller the wavelength we can use, the smaller this angle can be. All right, and so the common type of test question is to ask, what wavelength do you need to get this separation between the pits? Or they might say, if you use this wavelength, what do I need to be the separation of the pits? You can go from theta to lambda, or from lambda to theta. Um, either way, uh, whichever you like. You'll always be using the m equals zero case because you need the first order. Because you want things to be as close as possible. Remember, what we want is we want to be finding, the, the key is we want to put this light in the first dark spot. Okay. We want to put it in the first dark spot. You could put it in the second dark spot, but then you're getting more separation than you could. The way to get the smallest possible separation is to put it in the first dark spot, and that's when m equals zero. So another way of putting this here, remember that we want the smallest theta possible. So should we plug in a big number for m or a small number? Zero. So even if you hadn't even seen all this science, you could just see mathematically that if you want a very small theta, the way to do that is to put in the smallest possible m. You have to keep in mind, some of the, our formulas start with 1 and some start with 0. This formula starts with 0. m could be 0 here when the things are just one half wavelength, path length difference. 
Okay, so you can plug that in uh, there. All right, so we're almost ready to try that exam problem. Uh, just one or two other things to say. Um, oh, so we want a small wavelength. Now, remember from our discussion last time, when something has a small wavelength, does that represent that it's behaving a lot like a wave or a lot like a particle? Does it have a small wavelength, does that mean high wave? Like a small wavelength is like a particle. Yeah, this has um, less important wave characteristics. And more important, particle characteristics. We talked about that briefly last time. We just said that we should just memorize. Uh, so we've said that modern physics shows that everything has both wave and particle characteristics. This is weird, but everything has both wave and particle characteristics. But how do you know which one is more important? Well, if something has a small wavelength, then its wave characteristics are less important. We saw just as a memory aid, wavelength has the word wave in it. So small wavelength kind of seems, sounds like it means less important wave characteristics. So it means its particle characteristics are more important but we didn't say why that was. Well, this is our first example of why that is. This is our first example of how a small wavelength makes something behave more like a particle. Because remember, if the light was really particles, we could put the pits as close together as we liked. And this was true. Yeah, if the, um, if the light was, um, we, that was the example we did at the start. If light was really particles, the pits could be as close together as they liked, and the, and the particles would still always hit different spots. Because particles don't diffract, they don't spread out. So. If the light was really particles, all the light from pit one would go here, and all the light all the light from pit two would go here, all the light from pit one would go here, and the player would have no difficulty telling the difference um, between them. Well, we're getting closer and closer to the gap. We're, um, we're putting the pits closer and closer with the smaller wavelength. So this is our first indication that a small wavelength means less important wave characteristics. So before we do that problem, you have your textbook? Yeah. Why don't we take a look at page 565, because they have a good little essay here that would be good for getting questions from. Oh, no. All right, yeah, how about page 579? Okay. So they start by, on page 579 by talking about compact disks, CDs. Um, and they said that CDs are read with infrared light. So they put the pits as close together as possible um, to make sure that the beam from one infrared light from one pit is going to go into the next dark spot for the other pit. All right, and they saw, saw that when they were able to do that, um, they had a maximum capacity of 650 megabytes. Um, so a byte is just how much information you can put in there. So I guess basically a bit represents each pit, and a byte would be eight pits. So a megabyte would be eight million pits, something like that. Anyway, the important point is um, the infrared light put a limit on how close together the pits could be and how much information they could put in. All right, now notice what they say in the second paragraph. When they made CDs in the 80s, lasers could only produce infrared. At least cheap lasers could only do the infrared. Uh, but then as time went on, the lasers got better, um, and they started using red light in the 90s. In the 90s, they had cheap laser, uh, lasers that could make red light. Now, is the red light higher or lower wavelength than infrared? Uh, yeah, this is lower wavelength. Infrared means higher, uh, infrared light um, is lower frequency and higher wavelength. If you look at your spectrum, if you look at your spectrum, you'll see red light um, is a lower wavelength than infrared. That allowed them to put the pits closer, and that gave them a new technology, which was DVDs. So very few people were aware when DVDs came out that it was because they now had cheap red light, which allowed them to overcome this diffraction limit over here. But apparently, that was the main cause. So that's where they got the DVDs. All right, and now they want things that can record high definition television, um, which needs even more information. Um, well, now uh, in the 2000s, they have lasers that take violet light. Um, 
So you can see this is all driven by improvements in the laser technology. Now we have inexpensive lasers that, could, um, that you can put inside the uh, DVD player that shoot violet light. Now again, what's happened to the wavelength, gone up or down? This is again, lower wavelength. Uh, we know violet light, red light is the highest wavelength of the visible light. So violet light is the lowest wavelength of the visible light. Um, and again, we know that lower wavelength means it's more like a particle. And that means we can put the pits closer. So now they have what they call these new HD DVDs, high definition DVDs, where the pits are close enough that you can fit enough pits on to store the information from a high definition, um, uh, high definition broadcast. Okay. Um, so we can see that one of the main technological limiting factors here is how close we can put the pits, and that ultimately is coming back to the laser light. I'm sure there's other issues, but that was what they talked about in the uh, essay. So there's lots of ways you could make good uh, exam questions about this, asking people to explain how these changes have come about.